The Middle East was a battlefield for most of the 20th century. But one of the hardest fought wars of all was in 1973, when Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack on Israel on the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. For three weeks, the battle swung violently from side to side. It brought each within sight of victory and defeat. And it brought the superpowers, America and the Soviet Union, close to a nuclear showdown. The Israelis were in no doubt they were fighting for their country's very survival. For the soldiers of Syria and Egypt, it was a battle for Arab territory and Arab pride. In this program, I'll be revealing how Arab and Israeli commanders astonished each other with the boldness of their strategy. And I'll be finding out how both sides use the latest weaponry with shattering results. No 20th century conflict has been as lasting and bitter as the struggle between Israel and its Arab neighbors. This is the story of the biggest battle between them. It's still such a sensitive subject in Egypt that they wouldn't let us film there. This is the story of the October War of 1973. This concrete security barrier here runs through Jerusalem and hundreds of miles to the north and the south. On this side live predominantly Muslim Palestinian Arabs. On this side, the largely Jewish population of Israel. The eight meter high barrier, which the Israelis started building in 2002, is the most powerful symbol of the hostility between Jews and Arabs, which still remains after nearly a century of conflict. The Israelis say that they built this barrier to keep out Palestinian terrorists. The Palestinians say it's just Israel's way of grabbing more of their land. And that's what this conflict has always been about, land. Land known at the beginning of the 20th century as Palestine. Back in 1917, the British controlled Palestine and they promised the Jews a homeland here. The problem was there were more than 10 times as many Arabs as Jews already living in Palestine. And as hundreds of thousands more Jews poured into the country, open fighting broke out between them. By 1947, things were so bad, the United Nations stepped in with a plan. This is how Palestine looked then. Lying on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean, it was bordered by Lebanon, Syria, Transjordan and Egypt. The United Nations suggested partition. The Palestinians would keep land here, here and here, and the Jews would have the rest. Jerusalem would be an open city shared by everyone. The Jews accepted the plan, and in 1948, they declared their independence as the state of Israel. But the Palestinians and the neighboring Arab countries rejected partition. War followed, and the borders changed once more. The Israelis took over Arab lands here in the north and along the Egyptian border, ending up with most of Palestine and most of the key city of Jerusalem. Tens of thousands of Palestinians fled or were expelled from their homes. These refugees headed to neighboring Arab countries, creating a refugee crisis that lasts to this day. One night everyone was awakened to the sound of people. Go, go, the Jews, the Jews are coming. Yeah, I can still recall the voice and the ensuing chaos. Within a short period of time, the entire village was marching out, carrying their essentials, bedding on a mule, some clothing, some food. 
The Arabs refuse to recognize this new state of Israel, and their resentment at the loss of Palestinian homes and land grew. For their part, the Israelis felt vulnerable, surrounded on all sides by hostile Arab enemies. Over the next 20 years, there was regular fighting along the borders. In 1967, things finally came to a head. On the morning of June the 5th, Israel launched a preemptive strike against Egypt. It was followed hours later by attacks on Egypt's allies, Syria and Jordan. It would become known as the Six Day War. Almost 200 pilots of the Israeli Air Force took part in an incredibly ambitious airstrike. Their mission was to wipe out the Egyptian Air Force, the largest in the Arab world. In just under two hours, Israeli bombs destroyed almost the entire Egyptian Air Force before it had even got off the ground. Next, Israel launched strikes on the air forces of Jordan and Syria. By the end of the day, Israeli pilots had won total control of the skies. Not very far away, there were some military bases, and uh, they had been attacked early in the morning. There was nothing announced, and we didn't know what was going on. Defeat was unfolding right there. Israeli ground troops stormed into Syria, Jordan and Egypt. At the same time, other Israeli troops made a bid to capture Arab-held Jerusalem. On June the 7th, just two days into the war, Israeli paratroopers charged through this gate into the old city. As they pushed through these narrow streets, they came under fire from Jordanian snipers who'd taken up position in the upper stories of the buildings on either side. The Israelis pushed on. It took them a few hours to clear out these last pockets of resistance, but by early afternoon, the whole of Jerusalem was in Israeli hands. I took out the Israeli flag, which I carried with me the whole time, and waved it. I hung the flag on the fence. My commander, who was the toughest among us, was standing next to me. He burst into tears underneath his steel helmet. Another friend was whipping. A chain of bullets wrapped around his neck. In the days that followed, Israeli troops drove back the soldiers of Jordan, Syria and Egypt. In six days, the Israelis had won the war. The defeated nations counted the cost. It's estimated that Egypt lost 80% of its military capacity, and along with Syria and Jordan, suffered over 30,000 dead and injured. People didn't really know what was going to happen next. I mean, people were scared. The whole country was at a total loss of what to do. The fighting may have been over, but it hadn't created the conditions where the two sides could come together. Peace was as far away as ever. For the Arabs, the Six Day War was an utter disaster. Before this whirlwind campaign, Israel had been a tiny wedge of land, squeezed between Arab states, only nine miles wide at its narrowest. Suddenly, it was a Middle East superpower and five times the size. The borders had been pushed back to swallow a piece of Syria up here, called the Golan Heights. To the east, Israel had seized the West Bank 
and in the south, it now occupied Egypt's entire Sinai Peninsula, a huge expanse of desert. From this newfound position of strength, Israel's leaders demanded that the Arab world recognize the state of Israel. Arab leaders met in Sudan to formulate their response. They were emphatic. They would not recognize Israel and insisted on a total Israeli withdrawal from the territories it had just occupied. Over the next few years, both sides became entrenched and nowhere was this more visible than along the new border with Egypt. The Suez Canal. The canal is one of the world's busiest shipping lanes, allowing ships to pass between Europe and Asia without sailing round Africa. But after the Six Day War, this international waterway was closed to shipping as sporadic fighting between both sides continued to flare up. The Israelis and the Egyptians now faced each other eyeball to eyeball across the canal. The Egyptians could never accept that this was a permanent frontier. But the Israelis were equally determined. Egyptians now watched in horror as the Israeli military machine went to work. All along the Suez Canal, the Israelis built a massive network of walls, forts and trenches that became known as the Bar Lev Line. Israel resolved that Egypt would never force its way back into the Sinai. But they weren't just relying on the Bar Lev Line for defense. The Israelis also had a system for rushing troops to the front line. Israel has a small population and can't afford a large standing army. So every male Israeli does three years national service and remains a reservist into his 40s or 50s, ready to be mobilized in times of war. Today, females also do national service and they can also be called up if war breaks out. 30 years ago, an army of 250,000 men could be mobilized within 72 hours if the Arabs showed signs of attacking. But after the Six Day War, that didn't seem very likely. The Israelis had practically destroyed Arab air power. Israeli intelligence was now sure the Arabs wouldn't try anything until they'd rebuilt their air forces. And that would take another 10 years. The Israelis were now supremely confident that if their neighbors so much as twitched, they would batter them into submission once more. But in Cairo, something had happened that the Israelis hadn't reckoned with. A new Egyptian president with a new sense of purpose, Anwar Sadat. When Sadat came to power in 1970, Egypt was still a demoralized country, smarting from the loss of the Sinai. Sadat was considered a moderate by many, but one of the first things he did was appoint a dynamic and popular new military commander, General Saad El Shazli. Shazli was given the job of revitalizing Egypt's poorly trained and under-equipped army because Sadat was determined to do what the Israelis least expected, fight back. Sadat had decided that the only way to win back the Sinai from the Israelis was to make war on them. His plan was to launch a spectacular crossing of the canal and retake a strip of land in the Sinai. Sadat hoped that this would force the Israelis to negotiate a withdrawal from the rest of Sinai. But for this plan to work, Sadat was going to need help. Sadat found a willing ally in the Soviet Union, 